best thing about the Deep Foundations Institute is the collection of engineers, contractors, material and equipment suppliers, and academics. And so bringing everybody together means the stuff that we get done is useful and is immediately applied and is not in some out there academic corner or it's not promotional to one type versus the other. It's really a true collection of, of the best of this industry. Membership of the DFI has many benefits, as I said. Um, there's, for the younger members particularly, there's a wealth of knowledge um, within the DFI's uh, archives, if you will. The magazines, the journals, uh, the publications. We have this uh, organization called One Mind that we subscribe to, where there are literally thousands of documents on all aspects of deep foundation construction, design, etc. Um, so from that point of view, it's, it's a, a very, very important resource. Um, that comes free with your membership. Learning about technical advancements, uh, again, seeing what projects people are up to and what solutions other engineering firms have come up with, and then the networking opportunities that we get um, in the, at the in-person meetings like this conference. I think the technical committees are is just another great way to get involved in DFI. Uh, you meet a lot of, you know, people in the people in the industry that are very uh, influential and important. Uh, they make a lot of decisions that we, uh, you know, live by in the industry. So uh, when you participate in a committee like that, you can see firsthand how how uh, design and construction is kind of sculpted. So it's it's a uh, it's a lot of fun, and uh, it's a worthwhile investment. It's an organization basically that uh, guides not only the principles of what transpires in the Deep Foundation Institute or industry, but also um, brings everybody together to discuss common problems and provide solutions. I welcome you all again for the session one of Groundwork 2023 webinar. Uh, people joining us from different parts of work. Good morning, good evening, or good afternoon to all of you. I'll give a few quick instructions before we proceed. Recording of this webinar is prohibited. Participation certificates for student attendee will be emailed approximately in two weeks. An online webinar recording will be available on DFI of India YouTube channel approximately in week, two weeks time. In your uh, Groundwork portal, you have a Q&A uh, &A tab, as we are showing here on our screen. You can enter your questions, queries for our panelists anytime during the program. But now, without uh, wasting any more time, I'll um, introduce our moderator for the session, Mrs. Annapurni Ayer, ma'am. She's founder of Engoism Con Consultant, Pune is also an executive committee member of DFI of India. Mrs. Anupurni Ayer has more than 21 years of experience and has handled various critical soap stability issues, encountered projects like Mumbai Pune Expressway, Konkan Railway, Ahmedabad Vadodara Expressway, and many more. She has established her own consultancy firm, Engoism Consultant, in 2017. She has to her credit a number of national and international papers too. I welcome you, uh, Annapurni, ma'am, and I request you to kindly take the session forward. Thank you, Prana. So, very good evening to all uh, our respected panelists who have accepted our invitation to be present today. Thank you, DFI, for giving me this opportunity. Now, just a brief introduction on BF DFI is already seen in the short video. I won't take much time, just one minute, what DFI is and uh, what are we, what, for what have we assembled today here. DFI India is basically uh, an institute which focuses on bringing professionals together in one platform who specialize in deep foundation uh, related to geotechnical engineering. And under DFI, we have this groundwork that is student outreach program where we try to support young engineers as well as students to connect with the foundation industry. Okay. So after once we are out of the college or out of an institution, 
so we uh, look forward for opportunities to connect with the industry to make that easier or make it more you know uh, comfortable we have we have this kind of interactive session so this groundwork through this groundwork we have this first interactive session of this year and the theme is bridging the expectations okay and connecting academia with the industry so for this we have more than 185 participants or uh, registrations sorry from uh, 12 countries so we welcome one and all to this program to our panelists as well as who all the uh, you know, registered candidates who are here so we welcome once again and we request that this session has to be more and more interactive i understand that interaction will be in the form of chat or you can raise questions or whatever you wish to communicate or ask our panelists here so this will be the sequence of our groundwork session 2023 introduction of panelist theme discussion and uh, we have we'll be taking uh, questions and finally we'll be summing up with closing remarks and we'll also we also have a lot of upcoming events with dfi for uh, so that also will be briefed so that's it about the sequence now we'll go with the panelist introduction so you can uh, see here we have uh, prakash uh, shankar bansot sir who is a foundation expert and geotechnical advisor who has more than you know 40 years of experience he is with afcons infrastructure limited mumbai so when we say of course sir's cv is there on the screen you all can read and you know uh, you can estimate the kind of experience that sir is going to share with us today so when i see sir i have two quotes okay we can we cannot create you know experience you can only undergo it and gain it so that's where we have one sort sir here who has gained experience and he is here to share that with us and the only source of knowledge is through experience so welcome prakash sir we look forward to have an you know uh, very knowledgeable uh, session today with you of course i am sure that all our uh, participants are going to gain a lot from your experience Pranam, can we have a uh, next panelist? Yeah, welcome uh, Manas sir. He's uh, Deputy GM, HR, Keller Ground Engineering, India Private Limited, Delhi. Again, his detail is there in the screen. I will not read it out. You all please, uh, who are other candidates or who are, are joined here, please read it. So when we talk of HR, they are definitely a very strong interface between the no, 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 the candidate and the organization. Okay, so they hire character and train the skill. So that's how we look at HR, who not only you not know, train the skill. Of course, they ensure that the uh, whoever has joined the organization who is comfortable and giving his hundred percent towards the organization. So we welcome you, Manasa, for this event for this session, and I'm sure your thoughts about whatever discussions will be happening. Sure, um, uh, the young engineers are going to benefit out of it. Thank you. So, welcome to both the panelists and uh, all of the uh, registered uh, participants who have joined us today. So, uh, going ahead with the theme today, so bridging the expectation that is career prospects in geotechnical engineering industry. So, even though it is a specialized field under the umbrella of civil engineering, we know that geotechnical industry is basically the foundation without foundation no structure is going to stand correct okay? so there's where our role comes okay, we see all beautiful buildings but uh, what lay, lies beneath is what we are responsible we as geotechnical engineers are responsible for so what are the career prospects in geotechnical in engineering industry of course we'll not be able to cover uh, everything in one hour but still we'll try to take you know a few uh, points or we'll try to discuss a few points here so to start with the, uh, the you know the panel discussion let us uh, uh, talk to uh, manas sir that see your mantra what i can see from your cv is be the one who finds gold okay so can you briefly say how as an hr professional of course you have an engineering background from engineering background you are now practicing the hr field how do you trace out the gold that you're looking for or while you're interviewing freshers or young engineers? Over to you, Manas. Thank you, Annapurna. And at the outset, I would like to thank uh, DFI India for having invited me for this panel discussion. 
along with uh, industry veteran like Mr. Prakash, as well as all the people who have joined. Coming back to the tagline which you mentioned, uh, I must say this is something which I uh, live professionally as well as personally. When I'm saying professionally as well as personally, at times, not only as a HR professional or as a human being also, we tend to focus that we need to develop or we need, we need to work something or we need to manage or we need to improve our weakness. Our focus is always on that. I'm not saying that we should not improve our weakness or we should not be aware of our weakness. But at times, or I would say many a times, when we focus on our weakness, we lose sight of the strength which we are possessing. And we focus on the weakness at the expense of our strength. And ultimately, what was our strength, it goes away eventually because we are more concerned how to manage our weakness, how to develop our weakness. So as, as you correctly say, as a HR professional, when I interview people or when I meet many prospective candidate or employees, yes, no one is perfect in this world, but being an NLP practitioner as a neurolinguistic practitioner, for me, every human being has got abundant pot potential, abundant possibilities. So my focus always on to unlock that potential and to realize that. And as a HR professional, as a coaching professional, this is my duty or responsibility to facilitate that. So I think this is the man mantra I live by. And so far, I, I, it is a fulfilling for me and I feel that it will fulfilling in future as well. So uh, thanks, uh, Manas. What I understand is when you are interviewing, you look at more of the strong strong points or the strength of the candidates. Okay, of course, you when you as a as a you know this this much of experience in HR field, working in HR field, you will immediately able to even catch the weakness of the uh, candidate as well. But uh, you know that is where we'll have to train or uh, improve that uh, aspect. But yeah. pick up the strength and then uh, build it, build on from there. I think that's yeah. what the summary that that's I right. can. That's right. yeah. So I think all the young engineers present here along with us, I'm sure would have got, you know, what as an HR, okay, from a leading uh, company in geotechnical industry, how the HR looks at you as a young engineer, not, you know, uh, looking at the weakness. Of course, weakness will be felt when you are being interviewed, but at the same time, strength is what the company will be taking and building upon. So uh, build on your strength and definitely identify your weakness and work towards that. Thank you, Manas. So uh, coming to, uh, yes, uh, now we have uh, Prakash sir. So if we uh, start talking to Prakash sir, definitely I think uh, we can write books on his experience, based on his experience. So uh, Prakash sir, uh, you have seen industry more than four decades or no, so right from that time, when engineers were working with drawing board and you know, uh, drafting instrument and doing the uh, revisions with their own hands rather than AutoCAD. Okay, AutoCAD has made life so easy and beyond that as well. So what challenges now uh, you, know, you see that youngsters face to get themselves placed in the uh, geotech industry or foundation industry as a long term okay, and to build from there? Sir? Thank you, madam. To summarize, one should have curiosity, enthusiasm to work in this field of foundation engineering. The, most of the good sites near the cities have been already constructed upon. Our new construction project sites are coming in remote areas. So one should have a readiness or eagerness to work in field at remote site locations. Then, if you have to choose a career in foundation engineering, you have to start work at a lower level, at say, what we can say, grounds level. Say in soil investigations, or as a piling engineer, or as a diaphragm wall engineer, or as a grouting engineer. And master what are the basic of different uh, actual construction activities because our field of foundation engineering is say uh, 20 percent textbook learning and say almost 80 percent on on-site experience and these things when we started our career there were uh, only 
telephones and STD calls had to be booked for hours in advance. And we used to work in faxes. And our uh, directors make use of work on, say, mini drafting boards on A3 size sketches. And they used to make us draw all our simple, simple diagrams like foundations, piles, bar bending schedules by our own hand. We didn't have computers till, say, 2002 or 2004. Exposure to computer was practically nil. If you have to work in field, you should have curiosity, enthusiasm, endurance, stamina, and ready to work at site, say, from 8 a.m. till 8 p.m., and sometimes even longer also. For example, I will give example of piling. We have completed the pile, boring is done, reinforcement is lowered, concrete is being done, and suddenly trimming gets choked. It is an unexpected problem, and that adds to the delay of work. So we should be prepared to face such a delay. And especially in companies like Afcons, people are first put at sites at different uh, operations of working like say diaphragm wall, piling site, highway work site, JT work site, ground improvement site, and they are exposed to different aspects of working at site for an initial period of two, three years. And after that, only they are taken in head office for uh, office working. Today, everybody wants to directly start working in air-conditioned office in the comfort of uh, AC and all these things. So, yeah, at least in the field of foundation engineering, that is uh, not possible. And uh, then they uh, immediately if they get placed, they start losing interest and then switch over to IT-related things and all these things. Because, see, Basically, what data we get from groundworks or ground investigation goes into your design. That data should be sound and perfect. That is my advice to young engineers to beginning their career. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Yes, um, very, you know, very nicely said, very simply put forward, but those are the strong facts of today that if we see the development has mostly has happened in cities apart from the metro or the metro construction that is happening the rest all is happening in the in the you know, remote areas and as civil engineers or especially as geotechnical engineers we have to first love the site then only you will you know progress or you will be in love with the job correct so that's what uh, very rightly you have uh, put forward sir and i'm sure our young engineers would have got the idea and we uh, civil engineers are such gifted engineers that we can be proud of the structures that we have built okay we are the ones who build the offices for rest of the engineers be it mechanical engineers be it uh, it engineers all the beautiful buildings the it engineers sit and work are somewhere built by civil engineers so that pride and that feeling when you know a civil engineer takes definitely there won't be any barrier to be at the site so well, let us not compare uh, civil engineering with our it or the comfort of ac room so site is where we uh, learn maximum and that's how uh, bansod sir with a lot of experience is here so i think from his talk what i could understand is after 20 years of working is where he saw uh, computer right sir 2004 or 2002 that means already half you would have completed and half <laughs> rest half is when you started working with the computer so thank you sir thank you for sharing your uh, ideas so uh, i would urge the uh, participants to post their questions which we we'll, can take up with the panelists so it will be a kind of you know live interaction i will read out the questions on your behalf and our panelists can answer them so uh, we have uh, uh, manas probably you can take this we have ranita ray who is asking what are the soft skills appreciated by geotechnical background uh, industry requirements yeah thanks ranita for the question so one soft skill which i would like to stress upon is the deferred gratification 
when I'm saying deferred gratification is that it's opposite of instant gratification. That means the people have people should have or the young geotechnical engineers should have the patience. What Mr. Prakash was mentioning that everything cannot be your room cannot be built, built in one day. Everything cannot be done tomorrow or day before yesterday. They have to have patience. They have to go to site, work in the site. They should understand the basics and have an agile mindset. And if these things is equal to a good attitude, if this is there, or in summary, if the deferred gratification is there, then I think success will be there for every geotech engineers. The gratification, they should understand that it, it has to be deferred one. So this is my answer to Renita. Thank you. Link got uh, disconnected. Sorry. Thank you, Manas, uh, for that. So I think Ranita would have uh, got her answer and I hope she'll be preparing accordingly. Uh, next we have, uh, sir, I would like you to take this, uh, Prakash, sir. This, I think you are the best person who can answer, uh, you know, address this. We have Shrikant who is asking, what are the prospects for PhD scholars in the industry in developing countries like India? In addition, in your opinion, is there any need for industry to include PhD scholars, and if so, in what position? I think sir got disconnected, is it? Prakash sir? Yeah, he's joining again. You can take the okay. next question with Mona. Okay, 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 fine, fine, fine. Okay, so uh, maybe Manas, I'll, uh, uh, Take another question maybe, for you. Maybe Anapuna, I can attempt a little bit on this PhD part. Yeah, yeah, please. Because, please. because in Keller India as well, we are also encouraging some of the geotech engineers to pursue PhD. And we have got structured study leave policy, wherein we encourage people to go for PhD, whether it is part time or full time. And they came back and joined us. And even we used to hire some scholars as well. And there were PhD scholars who are working in our organization as well. So I think this is something which is a winning situation for both PhD scholars come the employee employee as an organization of Keller because they win win because whatever the you know additional knowledge or problem solving capability they are having or research methodology they are having they apply it in our real time problems and certainly you know their perspective or way of looking into a problem in a live project it really helps us so I think it's a win win for both and there are immense scope for PhD scholars in an organization like Keller. Thank you. Yeah, definitely, Manas. There are uh, definitely scope because uh, they would have definitely done that kind of research and studies that would definitely help in solving the industry problem in a That's quicker right. and a faster way. So, uh, so uh, definitely that background is going to add value as well. So. Uh, so there is no doubt that uh, PhD, you know, uh, what are the prospects? So prospects is uh, definitely there. Only thing is uh, that link of, you know, uh, research to industry. Because when we come to industry, it is definitely business and uh, profit margin that we look at. So right. that link, if we get it That's well, uh, yes, it's, it's, you know, uh, prospect yeah. is definitely very high. So uh, I think, uh, Shrikan, your question is also answered. Now, I'll take uh, one more question again uh, to Manas, uh, to you only. Okay, so as an HR professional, okay, uh, again, this partly you have answered, what attributes you feel youngsters need to develop uh, in themselves to get on their roles as quick as possible or as uh, you know efficient as possible? So I think soft uh, skill you already answered, but apart yeah. from that, anything else you can please add? So I, I think the crux of the matter is that they should be very strong in the fundamentals or basics. And if that, that has the foundation in terms of strong fundamentals or strong basics, then things will be good for them or things will be easy for them to learn new things, apply their mindset, apply their knowledge. That is one part. Second part, they should be open for any site posting, they should be open for you know working at site location. They should be open for without any timing that to learn and to take some kind of I would say I would not like to use the word struggle, 
but yes, some kind of pain as well. As we famously say, no pain, no gain. Some pain, they have to have it in initial years of joining of the organization from campus. And it will really make them, I would say, in the medium term and long term, the, the, the ROI would be immense, actually, return of investment on their own career. Because I think organization can give a platform, but it is the every individual responsibility to make their career. It is for them to take it in a positive spirit. And for fresh engineers, it is it is the requirement that they have a strong foundation, uh, strong basics knowledge. Whatever the project they do it, it should be more in line with industry. A application of mind should be there so that it, it is relevant to the industry. And also, I would say that they should also build up some kind of skills in terms of, apart from the syllabus, what they are having from their university or college, they should also try to go for some extra paper presentation, joining some technical you know, discussion, some symposium. So they, they can enlarge their knowledge base and certainly that will, that will help them in long run. I think these are the basic ingredients one graduate should do it. Thank you, Manas. Yeah, basically the self-development skills, both in uh, technical as well as an overall uh, development of that person is very essential. And it will benefit, right. as you said, the win-win for both uh, the, yeah. the, you know, the person as well, as well as the organization. So both are getting yes. benefited out of it. And yeah. as you said, rightly, patience, uh, pain, and struggle. Struggle is, uh, even though you very nicely said that you wouldn't like to use the word struggle, but struggle is definitely required. Okay, yeah. okay so that is there. Uh, so that, you know, only if you, you know, uh, you get polished as much as you are getting, you know, uh, you struggle. So, that, that is right. so we have Prakash, sir. Sir, again, uh, though Manas had answered this question, I would like to put this question again to you. Uh, because you would have seen uh, various levels of you know, uh, people in the industry. So what are the prospects for PhD scholars in the industry in countries like India? In your opinion, is there a need for the industry to include PhD scholars? And if so, in what position? There is a scope. In our uh, company itself, we have got uh, two PhDs. Dr. Basarkar and one other doctor is also there. But uh, requisite is they should have at least some uh, five to ten years of field experience after getting their PhD. They are taken at a very high level like uh, general managers or deputy general managers. Because their uh, fundamental or logical thinking is very clear. But our actual construction uh, process are quite complicated and a uh, lot of unexpected problems come there. So they should be prepared to solve those things. In fields of, uh, say, slope stability analysis, then tunneling, then uh, the deautering, there uh, these. Uh, PhD people have got uh, hands-on experience with different kinds of softwares and their academic uh, advantage definitely helps these organizations. Right, definitely, sir. Hmm. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Prakash, sir. Uh, now, again, uh, Manas, before going to the uh, next question from our uh, no, participant. Uh, yeah. Uh, how much when you take a, a fresh engineer, okay, say uh, you know directly recruit from the college, or say you know maybe uh, six months experience, uh, how much is the training period that you uh, give, and is it only the technical training that is allotted, or any other training program is also designed by uh, your company? How is yeah. it? So, so in Keller India, we have come up with a cadre uh, building just, program. Before going that, you can be, you know, even you can talk about industry also in general. Sure, how sure, the sure. So, so coming back to Keller India in specific, for our, you know, fresh engineers, we have launched one program in 2019 called the Young Engineer Development Program, YDP, wherein we went to campuses, we hired some fresh engineers, both BE as well as Zeotech, having experience of zero to one years prior experience. 
And what we did, we had around eight months of structured OGT on the training program for them. Wherein, you know, we, we send them to site, we expose them to various sub function at the site, be it planning, quality, execution, HAC, plant and machinery, et cetera. And after that, we discuss with them, we have a career dialogue with them to understand their key learnings and to help them build their career in their respective sub functions. So this is one way of building a talent pipeline in terms of research. And, and as I'm saying that, I don't think that a specific timeline is required. What is more important is that a structured mentoring and structured OZT, on job training. If you have these two structured things from organizational platform and from the candidate's perspective, as I said before, if the person is having an agile mindset, person is having attitude of deferred gratification, then I think this will fly like anything. Yeah, thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Manas. Uh, so can we have, uh, I would request our participants to post uh, more questions because it is basically for you, this uh, or as, a, as a, an attempt to bridge the academics as well as uh, with industry, this webinar is organized. So I would request you to put more uh, questions here. So uh, moving ahead with the, you know, with our session. So uh, can we take it uh, from uh, Prakash, sir? How industry can support uh, students to perform uh, well in the industry? So I think part of it Manas has answered. Maybe your take or uh, what you would like to share with our participants. In last uh, two, three years, our company, FCONS, has been taking students who are uh, about to complete their MTEC or about to complete their BTEC as an internee for, uh, say, two months during the vacation period, like May and June. And from this year onwards, we have taken almost 10 internees. We will be working for almost one year. In that one year, they will be routed through different sections of the office, sometimes at site and means 50-50, 50% work at head office, 50% works at site. And after seeing their performance, they will be permanently posted in the organization. That way, FCONS is helping. And I think Larson and Tubro is also having similar such uh, uh, training or selection of internees. And I don't know about the other organizations. But internees are being taken. They are being trained for a limited period of two, three months. That way, industry is uh, helping. Right. I think uh, the, uh, the, uh, the contribution from the industry of you know, taking interns, putting them you know, through their processes or making them comfortable with the industry, okay, absorbing or not absorbing is a later part, but at least making them accustomed to what the industry wants is wants are there from you know uh, from their you know, academic days onwards is has become a common thing and i think uh, you know, academics or our students should take benefit out of it so that way there is a, a great transition from earlier days to i think the current uh, what is the trend that is happening manas would you like to add anything on this in general, what is happening it's in the industry? Right, rightly said, that is, it's all about how you're balance, balancing it out and how the transition from corporate to organization is happening. And the bridge can be, as I said before, it's like a OZT on job training. But yes, at the same time, the internship also, I think it is a win-in for all. When, when a person joins the intern and that person contributes and when organization sees the person's value in the contribution, and that 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 internship ends up with PPO pre-placement offer. So I think it's a win-in for all. For the candidate, also it's good that he or she can take a conscious decision. Yes, whether this or this culture is good for me or not to continue. If I get a job, I have some and as an intern, I get some kind of experience. As an organization, can also test the person as an intern how he or she would be, and can he be a, he or she can be a prospective employee or not from an intern. So I think it's 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 a boost, both way testing can be happened from the organization as well as intern. And ultimately, 
you know, if both side decides to shake hands, then it's good for bo both. Correct, correct. A lot of, uh, you know, time is saved and the bond gets developed yes. from the uh, academic days onwards uh, yeah. within between the industry as well as the candidate. And, 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 that I, I don't want... I add on one more point that integration time get less than actually that is reduced. The integration time when a new employee comes, get integrated, get inducted, that is considerably reduced and they can start contributing to the organization. So that's a good part, one of one of the other good part actually. Very true. And yeah. a strong emotional bond also gets uh, developed between yeah. both of them. So that uh, helps in long run to both. Okay. Uh, yeah. Now coming uh, again, we'll take uh, a lot of questions are there. But still, let me see. Okay, uh, Manas, again to you as well as I think both of you have to speak. Maybe one after the other. In general, we can take. Uh, so, not being well paid has become a matter of concern in recent times. How can this be tackled to retain employees? Manas, maybe you can take, and then we'll have use from Sir as well. I'll repeat the question. So, Not being yeah. well paid has become a matter of concern in recent times. How can this be tackled to retain employees? So this is something I would say there cannot be a definitive answer because pay for me X amount, maybe I might, might be happy. But if my friend gets X plus one, I would be more unhappy. So it's something, you know, there is no definitive answer. But yes, as an organization, and I think it's an industry practice now. People are giving a premium to a premium talent. And that's the practice for a, almost every organization and almost all the sectors in geotechnical space as well. Yes, there is pay disparity is there, but disparity in terms of not on any kind of favorism, it's based on the skill set, based on the competencies. If you perform well, if you bring an extra delta to the to the table to the organization if you add a extra value then obviously you will come on an extra compensation as well and and when uh, even though we are talking more on phrase engineers and once person you know goes up to the ladder nowadays even though you know there are inflation or other related costs are getting increased but eventually organization also look into their overall waste budget as well and so what happened it also fine tune with the variable package. That means compared to fixed, the variable has being increased based on the additional delta one employee brings to the table. I think this is how the industry norm is being ha happening now. Okay. Yeah. Thank you. Uh, thanks, Manas. Uh, sir, Prakash, sir. In, oh, yeah, our companies, in old days, there was a dialogue. If you pay peanuts, you will get the monkeys. Now, in today's world, uh, see disparity between the software engineers and say, especially civil engineers has become quite big. And say, starting engineers get a package of say around 3 lakh, 3 lakh 60,000 in the year, whereas software man starts getting about uh, 6 lakhs. That cannot be helped, but companies are trying to help in other ways. They are giving them bonuses. They are giving them early completion incentives. And those who are really putting hard efforts and taking initiative and interest in their work, they get quick promotions and that disparity is being brought down to as much extent as possible. But one cannot expect uh, software uh, industry salaries in this uh, civil engineering industry. That is a Hard fact of life. We have to accept it. Thank you, sir. Uh, I'll just add, with your permission, I'll just add a few points because uh, based on my experience as well, I would suggest uh, uh, who has who has raised this question or has this in mind, uh, love love the job. When you love the job, definitely you will give your hundred percent. And when you are giving your, as uh, Mana said, a premium is paid to premium output. Or premium employees or whatever they yes. are what whatever value they carry so one uh, once you start loving your job or the profile or whatever is you know assigned to you definitely your output is going to be seen it will be evident and the output will flow 
okay as so as yeah, manas also said and sir also said that happiness or the uh, satisfaction in salary is person dependent okay and there is no limit to that or they cannot be reached even in software also nowadays it is seen that the pay is not really very high for the fresh engineers even we also in civil also for the freshers is this problem is there but as you go, grow up in your scale the, the salary is uh, getting improved significantly especially in good contracting as well as consultancy firms as well so uh, the same is there in it as well okay so let us not uh, say that i i mean in general the, uh, the fresher should not expect that it will have good pay scale you know, they are also having similar pay scale as we have when they are hiring as freshers of course it yes. gets into so uh, so that's the summary let's bring that you know love the job do your best and definitely the pay scale you will get the satisfaction as well as the improvement will be there so uh, we'll go to thank you both of you for this uh, taking this it is a very sensitive as well as important question as well now uh, we have uh, okay few more uh, questions i'll take okay um Uh, sir prakash sir again this is for from a phd uh, perspective what are the expectation from phd students when they apply for company keeping in mind they don't have past work experience what are the expect based on you know the, your experience of dealing with uh, phd's uh, uh, you could answer this that is you no know, what are the expectation from them yeah. whatever work is assigned to them they should uh, take it with interest as you said they should not think that uh, i am a phd guy and this work is too low for me and i will not uh, do it because compared to their academics or day to day routine jobs are not that uh, uh, highly sophisticated or requiring their uh, skill sets if they start taking interest in day to day activities then phd candidates are definitely welcome thank you thank you sir uh, manas you can take this one this is from madhumita mohanty can one move from academia to industry after 5 years of experience i think this movement will be easy provided there is a role alignment and role fitment for the individual so it is 5 years 6 year 8 years whatever the organization wants if the incumbent candidate is having those skill set and specifying as per a job description and if it is fitment then there should not be any bar what is the gap in between the role fitment is the key right very rightly uh, role fitment and alignment as you rightly said from academia to industry so the expectations are uh, different on both the fields and so definitely if that alignment is there we don't see you know because the basic requirements remain the same that is hard work your commitment remains the same only thing is that alignment is needed so thank you manas for that uh, i don't see any question from female engineers specifically so i would like to put this question to manas okay so with your hr experience uh, what are the uh, you know what how, how do you see that the industry outlook has changed okay towards hiring female engineers in general so as a, as a as a industry as well as in keller india per se dni diversity and inclusion is one of our focus area and but at the same time there are certain limitations as well but when we go for hiring outside or when we interview someone we always hire for right talent irrespective of gender is it male or female our prospective has the right competencies and role fitment should be there and gender comes second secondary but when we hire a female candidate or a female employee as a organization it is our responsibility as well to create an ecosystem which should be at least for the female colleagues because we are a construction sector and when we go to a site location there are certain limitations you know because 
a lot of activities are unorganized and 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 the or for example a small washroom facility guest house facility or remote location so extra care on female safety so those ingredients are to be taken care of but i don't see this will be a limiting factor because prior to keller i was part of sr and i was uh, i worked in a remote location in paradeep as well where i could see lot of civil engineers where female engineers were working and they were at par with all the male colleagues so i think if a female employee or female colleague thinks herself that i am at par i am not the weaker link then i think no one can you know stop their progress thanks a lot manas i really appreciate your first line that we hire the right talent and gender comes uh, second so this really shows that you know how open our industry has uh, you know has become maybe a transition has happened because earlier of course the uh, uh, candidates were also less okay, because we females who took up civil engineering were also limited but now as that has changed this whole uh, transition is also happening with this thought process i am sure any uh, you know uh, talent or any uh, candidate who is here listening or having some questions about whether there is any place for female engineers or no there is no barrier at all it is just the talent that is required correct so now coming to uh, and we don't have much time we just have 15 minutes now so, so we have one question but i think that question has come to me but still i'll put it to uh, that has i mean the candidate doesn't know he, that question has come to me do you think there is space in geotechnical industry for startups how difficult is it uh, to become successful compared with other industries so i'll take it with uh, permission of both of you if it is okay uh, manas and prakash sir can i take this question yes sir. definitely yeah so uh, shrikan so definitely there is a uh, lot of scope for startups in geotechnical industry right from investigation to providing solution to execution okay and even hr related uh, is scope also is there so there is no limit to that okay so and definitely there is scope only thing is you should have the right knowledge right background before you go into startup you take the ample experience that is needed to build on the startups or to start you know, go ahead with the startup and then build on from there there as well you need more patience than when you are in a as an employee because as an employee you are in a secured environment you have your peers you have your seniors you have juniors to you who will help you to you know uh, who will secure you from all the sides but when you come as a uh, entrepreneur you are on your own so remember that when you are you know comparing both the things and uh, when you want to be as a successful so be ready to take that hardship so that's it uh, as when you talk of a start now coming to uh, okay uh, prakash sir this is again an interesting question which you have already addressed but still if you want to add something you can see sometimes our management wants to work fast okay what is your suggestions please elaborate your point of view maybe what i understand is uh, the top management wants results from the uh, you know middle or the lower management quickly so what are your suggestions you have in this regard the top management is always worried about completion of the project in time now sometimes due to some unexpected problems project get delayed and then they want to cover the delay or make up for the delay and in such cases uh, then employees have to put some extra hard work but they are rewarded for it i will give one example see this chenna bridge which is now in quite news that work was awarded to afcons in august 2004 and initial construction period was only two and a half years now it has taken almost 18 years to come to a stage where now that arch has been completed and that bridge will be mostly commissioned by this uh, december 2023 or january 2024 so one has to have patience 
Sometimes this happens, means piling gets delayed or tunneling work gets delayed due to some unexpected problems and managements compel the staff to work or put in extra efforts to try to make up for the delay. Thank you, sir. Definitely, as you rightly said, when uh, they are being asked to work more or give output more, they are being equally rewarded as well, right? So rewards yes. are, are on one side, but at the same time that uh, the candidate shall think about the kind of experience that he is going, he or she is going to get from this, you uh, know, working or working under pressure or working under you know, kind of uh, some limitations. Yes. Always it brings out you know, a great feeling as well as experience. So that is the takeaway, key takeaway, take apart from the rewards, whatever the company would be giving back. So uh, thank you, sir. Uh, I think most of the other questions we have taken, that is, what are the skills required in a company for fresher geotechnical student? I think, Manas, you have already addressed that. Would you like to add anything? Uh, what are the, com uh, what are the skills yeah. required in a company? Yeah. I think there are two main aspects we should look into for the fresh geotechnical students. First one is strong basics. And second one is agile mindset. I think if these two are strong enough, then these things can be taken care of. So, uh, okay. So I, I would like to add one thing. Yes, sir. See, in old days, uh, we were uh, sort of brought up in philosophy. Once you join an organization, you leave it after retirement only. Now, today that mindset has been changed. After every two years, people go on switching. Uh, and that way what happens? Uh, rolling stones don't gather any moss. People should stick at least for five, ten years and then switch for... Uh, so then their career will get perfect. They will get perfect experience. Otherwise, by switching from company to company, they may get different experience, but they won't get perfect. That's my advice. Right, sir. Very rightly said. So you have to stick to a place to gain knowledge and experience and to add value to yourself before you move on. So, yeah. Thank you, sir. Now, I think this we'll take this as a last question. And I wish both of you give your uh, you know, uh, views on that. See, we see that there are uh, technically competent student, competent students from vernacular colleges. However, they lack uh, certain communication skills, maybe English. So, do you think that this could be a drawback in uh, selecting the students or uh, selecting that candidate? Uh, this you can take, Manas. And when I come to Sir, I would say that do you think this could be a drawback when the candidate is giving output uh, while he's you know selected and he's taken into the job? So there are two parts into this question, actually. When a student starts his career or her career or initial two to three years, when he or she learns the thing, and when the working structure is limited one, where the work contexts are within the internal organization, probably, you know, if the person doesn't know well or doesn't communicate very fluently in English, it's okay. But as one moves up the career ladder, business communication is required. And when I'm saying business communication, not that you know the person has to be fluent in English, but business communication in terms of how one handles in with other people, all his stakeholders. The stakeholders could be internal and external. And that time, the business communication should be robust and English is part of that. And, and, and to add on, this is not something that you no, know, it, it is a R&D work for anyone. The person who cleared geotechnical, you know, course, who cleared civil course, they can, you know, learn it very quickly. And there are a lot of, you know, I would say courses available online, offline. And nowadays, in, with a, you know, with a smartphone era, with a click of a button, they can learn many things. So I think this is some kind of, you know, invest me, investing on self for their own betterment in future. Yeah, very right, very right, Manas. So it's only a matter of will to develop that, you know, uh, skill in you. Uh, sir, uh, again, the same question. 
so uh, and that was for hiring now when i come to you i would like to know that does it become a hindrance when that candidate is giving start is starting to give output within the industry see that hindrance is at the stage of interview and getting selected only because in our days uh, what we used to we used to ask him to write one page uh, about his uh, what he has learned in engineering and what his experience is and if he is not able to write uh, even one page in say 10 15 minutes then that candidate gets rejected outright because four years of engineering he has learned and he has not even uh, mastered simple communication skills that shows a sort of negative picture on that candidate later on it doesn't matter because in our company also people speak in uh, all languages but that candidate gets rejected at selection stage itself so advice to students is they should master english because it is an international language and uh, one has to master it thoroughly you can master the complicated engineering subjects then what is difficult in say simple effective communication english skills that should not be entrance to anybody at all yeah very right sir i think manas this is very nice that sir told that you know uh, for at that time they were asked to write four or five lines or few lines about their experience and then and there the decision would be taken whether that communication of that person is good or not maybe nowadays we don't use that uh, procedure we have beautifully made cvs by the professionals candidate even doesn't know what is being written in <laughs> anyway nice uh, prakash sir we have learned uh, i think manas has learned something for interviewing as well. he can introduce that in his procedure uh, <laughs> definitely and i think uh, not only to present themselves even for writing technical reports english good english has to be there it, it need not be high five but you know very simple language communication has to go in the right way whatever you are seeing at the site whatever you are implementing at the site all has to be presented in a simple way to your manager or to your client both uh, technically as well as your soft skill for your presentation to the management or outside stakeholder as well. so definitely that is important uh, though it is not a hindrance you can definitely develop that skill and uh, we know it so i think uh, we have almost uh, reached our time limit it was really great to have both of you communicating and i think we have covered a lot of points starting from fresher the skills that a fresher needs to a phd's concern that how he will be placed or whether he has a place in the industry or no we also talked about you know uh, uh, the pay aspects in the industry okay the, the skills that has to be developed by a, a senior person or even a junior uh, fresher as well we talked about the outlook that the industry has towards female engineers where manas very rightly said that it is a right talent that we pick and not the gender comes as secondary we also talked about top management's you know a requirement or quick requirement of deliverables and how that can should be taken as an opportunity by the employees or the candidates and develop themselves and finally we also talked about the communication or the candidates coming from vernacular medium how they are uh, you know looked upon as so it is definitely it is the same when in, whether it is vernacular or english medium or very good uh, you know uh, english speaking student it is the same only the will to develop themselves to present in a better way so uh, that was the, the session that we had so uh, thank you very much uh, prakash sir for taking out your time Uh, definitely we enjoyed going back to your days of you know uh, doing drafting with the board drawing board being at the site and asked to write your own experience in 5 10 minutes and then being judged on that so you took us back to that uh, days and we are in a actually in a much uh, better or advanced uh, you know uh, days now where the communication is so strong tools are there so uh, definitely a lot to learn from you as well as you no know, lot of takeaways are there thank you manas for your presence we you know you being an engineer you know practicing the hr field so it's uh, that is again one field where you know uh, I, the candidates can look upon that you know they need not be always in technical they can even look at this field you know where you bridge 
the requirement of the industry as well as the uh, candidates who come out from the academics. So thank you, thank Manas. You. Thank you, Prakash, sir. It was great having both of you. And I'm sure our uh, candidates or whoever were registered participants are there would have also enjoyed this session. So over to the organizers. Thank you so much uh, to the panelists, Manas sir and Prakash sir. And also thanks to Annapurni ma'am for beautifully moderating the session. I thank uh, all three of you. Before we close the session, I'll just give uh, details of, of the upcoming programs. That is in this groundwork webinar series, uh, session two we have, session three and session four. Just remember it is all the third Thursdays of each upcoming month, Thursday 16th March, Thursday 20th March, Thursday 18th March at five to six and details of upcoming program you will receive in your mail to our announcements or you can also follow us on LinkedIn to get the updates in advance. Also, uh, as most of you may already know, we are planning the next DFI annual conference, DFI India 2023 in Vadodara, Gujarat this year. Call for abstract for technical paper is open. The deadline is 20th February. That is the next Monday. We have uh, these listed themes, nine themes. If you want to publish your technical paper in the conference, please send your abstract. That is 250 to 300 word abstract um, to publish your paper. You can go to DFI website. You will have the call for abstract uh, portal there. You can submit. You will also receive the call for abstract document in your mailbox after this program. So I encourage all the students or the participants from industry to send their papers. With this, I thank everyone again, all the panelists, all the uh, participants and the moderator for this session. And uh, thank you for attending. We'll see you back in the groundwork session two on 16th March, 2023. Thanks a lot.